Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Let me introduce our speaker who is one of us, well known uh, to our College of Medicine and our Academic Medical Center. Uh, our speaker today is Dr. Edward Hall, who is the director of the uh, Scoberg, uh, our spinal cord injury uh, center. And uh, uh, just a little bit about Dr. Hall. Dr. Hall received his doctorate in neuropharmacology from Cornell University uh, in 1976, he completed a postdoctoral fellowship at Cornell and then uh, came to Neocom, uh, Northeastern Ohio University's College of Medicine, uh, and he rose to the rank of associate professor of pharmacology there. He moved to the Upjohn Company in 1982, and uh, he there initiated and led an effort over a number of years to discover uh, agents for the treatment of traumatic brain injury and spinal cord injury and stroke. He left up John in 1997, joined Park Davis Pharmaceutical Research, which is now part of Pfizer, uh, and uh, he uh, rose there to the uh, rank of Senior Director of Central Nervous System Pharmacology uh, in that group. We were fortunate enough uh, in 2002 to attract uh, add to our place, whereas, as I said, he served admirably and continues to serve admirably as the director of the Spinal Cord Injury and Brain Injury Research Center. Uh, he's professor of anatomy and neurobiology, neurosurgery, and neurology. He's an authority on the pathophysiology of acute neurological injury, particularly the role of reactive oxygen mechanisms and the design and development of antioxidant neuroprotective drugs. Uh, one of the things that uh, Dr. Hall is most known for is his uh, leading role in the development of high-dose steroids, high-dose methylprednisolone therapy for acute spinal cord injury. Uh, he's uh, been well recognized for his work. Uh, he's currently a section editor for the Journal of Neurotrauma, and uh, he is the current president of the National Neurotrauma Society. So I'd ask you to join with me in uh, wel welcoming uh, to uh, the platform for his presentation, Dr. Hall. Well, thank you, Dean Perman, for that very uh, generous uh, introduction. It's a pleasure to be here. I thank all of you for uh, coming and taking your lunch hour to, uh, to, uh, to hear what I have to say. Uh, and it's a pleasure for me to be here. It's a pleasure for me to be at UK. Uh, uh, Dean Perman indicated UK was fortunate to get me. Well, let me tell you, Ed Hall thinks that uh, he was fortunate to come here and for uh, UK to take a chance on him. So uh, anyway, I look forward to telling you today about one aspect of, uh, of my work. Uh, having to do with spinal cord injury, as Dean Perman indicated, I've also spent time working on stroke and, and traumatic brain injury. Uh, and in fact, coming back to UK allowed me to sort of revitalize my interest in, uh, in spinal cord injury because during my industrial years, because spinal cord injury happens to be what is often referred to as an orphan condition uh, affecting a relatively small number of people, it was not something that I could uh, work on uh, except behind closed doors in the context of industry during my last uh, few years. Uh, and so it's really great to be in a place where I can uh, uh, focus again on uh, what's really my, uh, my first love. Well, before I get into the title of my talk is Acute Spinal Cord Injury, a Devastating uh, but Treatable Disorder. And when I talk about spinal cord injury, I typically introduce it with the work with the word devastating because, in fact, uh, the sudden imposition of an injury to the spinal cord of an individual is typically devastating to that individual and to their family because, in most cases, it drastically changes uh, their life and uh, has major uh, social and economic and emotional uh, uh, consequences. 
And so it, tr it, it truly is appropriately, I think, is uh, expressed as being a devastating disorder. But what needs to be realized, it's not a hopeless disorder. It's a disorder that uh, I firmly believe is treatable, and I'm going to show you some aspects of, uh, uh, that, uh, of that, uh, that support that fact. But before I do, uh, let me begin by talking about the, uh, uh, some of the anatomy so that everybody's on the same page. And I realize that this is a very general audience, so uh, hopefully you'll bear with me. I've tried to minimize the sort of the hardcore uh, stuff, but uh, there's a little bit of that in there, so just kind of go with the flow, if you will. But uh, just to worry on everybody, of course, this is the spinal cord. The spinal cord is responsible for representing the conduit for sensory information coming to the brain from the peripheral nerves throughout the body, as well as being the conduit for motor uh, information that comes down uh, and affects uh, movement uh, of, of the entire body. If we look at the spinal cord with the bone, uh, the bony spinal column in which it's contained, taken away, uh, you see that there are four different sections of the spinal cord, the cervical cord, which is the portion of the cord that runs through the vertebral column in the neck, the thoracic, which runs through the, uh, uh, the chest cavity, the lumbar, which uh, uh, contains the nerves that uh, go to the legs as well as nerves that go to the abdomen, and then, of course, the sacral uh, portion of the, of the spinal cord uh, down here that is really pretty much like a series of uh, nerve roots coming down, often referred to as the cauda equina. So that's the normal anatomy. Uh, in the case of the cervical cord, we have this enlargement, which is referred to as a cervical enlargement, that's enlarged because it contains the motor neuron cell bodies on which nerves coming from the brain, uh, motor nerves come down and, and make contact and stimulate so that movement of the arms can take place in the upper part of the, of the body and the shoulders. Uh, in the case of the, of the lumbar spinal cord, there's also an enlargement down here which contains a large body of motor neurons uh, that um, uh, control movement in the legs. Uh, if we look, as I said, the spinal cord is a very delicate structure. Uh, it contains both the gray matter uh, in the center of the cord, referred to as the gray matter. It's not really gray in reality, but it's called the gray matter. And the gray matter contains the neurons in which, uh, that receive input from the periphery, either uh, afferent neuro, uh, neurons, which carry sensory information into the spinal cord and they, where it's processed and then sent up to the brain, as well as motor neurons, which are in this part of the gray matter, that send out uh, nerves that go to the muscles that control movement. Our spinal cord is protected in part by being contained in this bony, uh, within the vertebrae, within the spinal canal of the vertebrae, and of course the part that's on the anterior is the uh, anterior body of, of the vertebrae, and then in between these vertebrae, of course, are discs that separate them and cushion them. If we look at a rat spinal cord, which is not that different from a human spinal cord, you see that when it's stained appropriately, we can see that there's this gray matter which contains these nerve cells that are either sensory neurons or, or, um, or motor neurons. And then in addition, the surrounding part is called the white matter, even though it's blue here, not white. But we call it the white matter because it contains the nerves, the nerve tracts that go up and down the spinal cord that carry sensory and motor information uh, in both directions. Uh, if we do a cross section of the spinal cord, uh, we, the other protecting aspect is we see that the spinal cord is con contained within a dural sheath that has cerebrospinal fluid in it to protect it and cushion it from, uh, from damage uh, as we move. If we look at, again, at a cross section, this is a human spinal cord in this case, and if we look at this schematically, what we have is sensory nerves that come in and make contact onto motor neurons, possibly, and those motor neurons send out fibers that go to the muscles that control movement. Uh, this basic uh, setup here represents the, the basic reflex arc or the knee jerk uh, arc uh, that people are familiar with. Uh, as we go up and down the spinal cord, the spinal cord gives off pairs of nerves that go to different sections of the body which are referred to as dermatomes. And you see here listed the different, uh, for, the cervical vert for the cervical portions of the spinal cord, the different segments of the cervical cord, the different segments of the thoracic cord, and, uh, and further down, that control specific areas of the body, which are, are termed dermatomes. 
Now, if we have a spinal cord injury, if that spinal cord injury occurs in the neck, what it's going to do, of course, is going to affect all four limbs. It's going to interrupt sensory and motor information going to the four limbs. And uh, this is referred to generally as quadriplegia, representing the fact that it affects all four limbs. If, in fact, the injury occurs in the thoracic spinal cord, then the arms are spared, uh, are still quite strong, uh, but the uh, patient is paralyzed from that point down. The degree of quadriplegia or the degree of paraplegia can be either incomplete or complete. And by that, I simply mean that if we have incomplete quadriplegia or incomplete paraplegia, there may be some residual sensory and maybe some residual motor function that's still preserved. In contrast, complete spinal cord injuries represent a complete loss of sensory and motor information uh, passage uh, beyond the level of the lesion. If we talk about injury to the high portion of the, of the spinal cord, we refer to that person as being a high quad. If it's down between C5 and C8, they're a low quad, and of course a low quad has more functional preservation than a high quad. As I said before, paraplegia represents any a patient with loss of function at uh, the first thoracic segment or below. And I've already defined complete and, uh, and incomplete. Well, some statistics. There are about 250 to 400,000 people that are living uh, with the effects of spinal cord injury. Uh, spinal cord injury in most cases is not uh, does not result in acute death, although it can in the case of the high cervical injuries in particular. Uh, very importantly, there are about 10 to 12,000 new cases uh, per year. Uh, the majority of these, the vast majority, are in males uh, with a smaller proportion in females. Uh, most of the cases are in the younger age. Uh, the the uh, typical range is expressed as being uh, between 16 and 30. Uh, the average is about uh, uh, 33, uh, the median uh, is about 26, and most frequently uh, young people in their upper teens are the high, at highest risk for sustaining a spinal cord injury. Well, why would that be the case? Well, uh, many of the, some of the major causes are uh, uh, represented by uh, certain activities that carry with them a certain amount of risk. Uh, the vast majority, of the big, not majority, but the biggest fraction are uh, caused by motor vehicle crashes of one type or another. Uh, another group are the sporting uh, related injuries. Of course, violence is, uh, uh, affects a portion, uh, as well as some other uh, kind of odd uh, kind of injuries, one of which I'll tell you about in a few minutes. Uh, in the elderly, increasingly, we're seeing more spinal cord injuries occurring in elderly patients. Most of these are from falls. And so uh, while there's uh, the biggest population is among the young folks who are doing risky activities of one type or another, uh, there are uh, increasing numbers of injuries among the elderly related to inadvertent uh, falls. As I said, uh, it's generally a disorder that does not lead to death, and 85% of patients who survive the first 24 hours are still alive 10 years later compared with about 98% of the SCI, non-SCI population. So even though most survive, it's still not uh, the kind of survival uh, that most of us can look forward to if we don't have injuries. If we look at the distribution of types of injuries, about 30% of cases lead to incomplete quadriplegia where there's some residual sensory and motor function. 22% uh, experience complete quadriplegia, which obviously is more devastating. Uh, in the case of the paraplegics, which represents a little less than half of the overall population, 19% uh, are incomplete, and 25, 26% have complete paraplegia. Again, that means total loss of sensory and motor function below the level of the injury. Now, in the case of neuro complete neurological recovery, in other words, a person who has a spinal cord injury and makes a complete recovery, the chance of that happening is less than 1%. So it's a very devastating thing. Uh, your chance of getting away scot-free uh, from an injury without any kind of treatment uh, other than the standard kind of supportive care uh, is, is not very good. If you look at the uh, quadriplegia in a little more detail, as you go from high injury, C1, C2 injuries, uh, these are people who can't move any of their four limbs at all and usually because it interferes with some of the respiratory muscle innervation in the uh, upper spinal cord uh, that these people typically have to be on a respirator. 
A case in point would be the very famous Christopher Reeve, whose injury was in fact very, very high, and until late in his life when they put in a diaphragmatic uh, pacemaker, he had to be on a ventilator just like this person. Well, if you go to, even down to C3, chances are there's going to have to be ventilatory assistance and very limited ability to move the arms. Uh, somebody who has a C4, or C5, C6, C7 is proportionally has more ability to use their shoulders, to use their arms, and also if they're a C7 or C8, to be able to use their fingers effectively. Now, the American Spinal Injury Association has developed an impairment scale that's a fairly crude scale to express the level of impairment, and it goes with uh, five different letter grades. Uh, the most severely impaired are the uh, Asia A's, in which there's no motor or sensory function preserved uh, below the level of the lesion. In the case of the Asia B's, these uh, patients may have some sensory uh, uh, activity, uh, but no motor function is preserved, including at the lowest segments. A grade C is somebody who has some motor function uh, present below the level of the injury, but the strengths, if you evaluate neurologically the muscle strengths, uh, they're generally on the weak side, less than a score of three out of a possible five in terms of normal motor strength. Asia D gets a little bit better, a motor function present below the level of the injury, but the strengths are a little bit more on the upper uh, uh, side of the strength scale. And E represents somebody who did manage to get, had a spinal cord injury, but managed to get back to, uh, to norm, uh, normalcy in terms of motor and sensory function for all practical purposes. This, as I've said before, the chance of getting to E without any kind of treatment is less than 1%. Now, when I talked about, I mentioned a moment ago about the evaluation of the muscles, this just shows some of the details as far as the uh, zero to five scale for assessing uh, motor function in different dermatomes, uh, and also uh, sensory function in terms of light touch uh, pinprick and also anal sensation uh, that are evaluated neurologically. Now it's a very devastating uh, thing to have a spinal cord injury. Uh, as I said before, uh, it's also very devastating in terms of the uh, economics associated with the injury. Uh, and of course, the higher the injury, the higher the first year as well as the ongoing costs to maintain that person's life. One of the things that I'm charged with uh, uh, as heading up the Spinal Cord and Brain Injury Research Center is to, to work on fundraising and uh, the most people, uh, the most likely people to be interested in funding the kinds of things we do are people who come from families that have sustained injuries and have a real sensitivity to the problem. But because of the huge costs associated with caring for uh, themselves or their loved ones, uh, it's, uh, unless the person is very, very wealthy indeed, it's very tough for them to think about personally doing much uh, about this disorder. So very expensive, and these figures uh, go up all the time. The other thing about spinal cord injury is that even though most patients survive the acute injury, uh, the lifespan that somebody who's a high quad or a low quad is going to have relative, uh, relative to a person who never had a spinal cord injury is going to be uh, truncated significantly. So this shows that if you were an injured person, uh, you were injured when you were 20, that if you never had a spinal cord injury, you'd on average live another 57 years. If you're a high quad, at best, you're probably going to have 33 years. If you're a low quad, it's a little bit better. Even if you're a paraplegic, uh, you're going to have a, a lessened lifespan uh, on average. Now, why is that the case? Well, people who have sustained spinal cord injuries, particularly the quadriplegics, uh, are going to be prone to renal infections and renal failure. They're going to be prone to repeated bouts of pneumonia. And also, because of inactivity, uh, their susceptibility to cardiovascular disease and diabetes is going to be increased. And of course, uh, you may recall, those of you who read the Herald Leader, that a young man who sustained a spinal cord injury last summer uh, here in the Lexington area uh, who was making a reasonably good recovery, uh, uh, chose to take his own life. So uh, this uh, is an important consideration as well. Well, why did I become interested in spinal cord injury? Well, quite frankly, um, uh, if you would have known me when I was a child, I was much more interested in probably going into the history field, uh, particularly military history, and that's still a hobby of mine. Uh, but something happened in my teenage years that, was, uh, that affected me a great deal. And that was when my father uh, was diagnosed when I was 15 with a, uh, a cervical spinal cord tumor. Uh, 
uh, that was operated on, but because it was an intermedullary tumor, couldn't be uh, removed. And he went on uh, to become, in 1970, a C5 quadriplegic um, and uh, spent the next 20 years of his life as such. And uh, so he was treated in different veterans hospitals, and, and mainly the one in Cleveland, where they had an 80-bed spinal cord injury unit. Well, in the early 1970s, that spinal cord injury unit was inhabited by a lot of Vietnam uh, veterans who were coming back with combat-related injuries, as well as some injuries related to automobile accidents and the like. And so I got to see a lot of what spinal cord injury looked like. My father was not truly an injury, but the effect of this tumor was the same because he became a complete quadriplegic as a result. As if that wasn't enough, uh, right after I came to UK, about five months later, we got one of these terrible early morning, morning phone calls. It was from my sister-in-law uh, outside of Cleveland, Ohio, and my nephew, uh, Nathan Gay, uh, my wife's brother's son, uh, had been at a friend's house uh, the day after Christmas and was uh, uh, horsing around, as far as we know, and was accidentally shot in the neck with his friend's uh, shotgun. And uh, it, he almost lost his life. He spent a year in the hospital in Cleveland uh, and came out of that as far as uh, with a severe spinal cord injury, uh, C7 to C8 uh, quadriplegic. Uh, he still has a, a tube in his neck because of the damage to his trachea and esophagus, uh, but much of that's been repaired and he's going on and living a very brave life. But this represented another, uh, as if I needed it, an inspiration to, uh, to work on spinal cord injury. Well, the good thing about spinal cord injuries, in most cases, not my nephew's case, which was a gunshot related, but uh, in most cases of traumatic spinal cord injury, most of them do not involve transection of the spinal cord. But yet, acutely, the spinal cord is left intact, and what happens in the typical kind of injury, uh, either somebody diving into a shallow pool or, be, or automobile related, is that there's a fracture of the neck, the verte vertebral bodies fracture, become displaced and put a make a compressive injury uh, to the spinal cord as you see here. But the continuity of the spinal cord at least initially suggests that if you could do something quickly enough that uh, there would be a chance of recovery taking place. Where he here's a, a real uh, case, an MRI image of a C5 cervical dislocation uh, showing again that this little uh, Netter diagram that I showed you a moment ago is, is fairly typical. Uh, here you see the broken neck, the vertebral body again pressing in on the spinal cord. Uh, you see uh, hypodensity on this uh, uh, T1 weighted, uh, I think it's a T1 weighted image, uh, showing the area of the spinal cord that's affected by edema. Uh, but nevertheless, there's continuity of the spinal cord, suggesting that if you could do the right thing and do it fast enough, that recovery might take place. I mentioned before that there's an increasing number of, of spinal cord injuries occurring among the elderly uh, as we uh, uh, prolong our lives through uh, other medical breakthroughs and live longer. Well, of course, we have a risk of, of uh, falling and uh, sustaining an injury. And in the case of the spinal column of an older person, they have these uh, vertebral bodies that have perhaps formed osteophytes that stick out and protrude into the spinal cord. And so then if they sustain an injury, the chance of them having uh, a compression, uh, compression or contusion injury of the cord with intramedullary hemorrhage uh, is, is probably, in fact, much greater than, in, in fact, in a younger person. But again, the point to remember is that most spinal cord injuries do not involve actual transection. If you look at uh, the histology, uh, this is a patient who died, uh, was a C6, C7. I don't know exactly the case here, uh, uh, but uh, this person died, and so they could look at the early pathology, and here you see this hemorrhagic necrosis that takes place within the injury site, but there's still a lot of uh, essentially uh, grossly normal tissue that contains nerve fibers that if those were salvaged, uh, might be able to support recovery. Well, we can do the same kind of injury in the laboratory, and as you might expect, we need to do that if we're going to study treatments for spinal cord injury. They have to do this in, uh, in rodent species. This is a, uh, the leading device, I think it's fair to say now, that's used in spinal cord injury research uh, to produce a contusion injury in rats or mice. And this device was developed by Dr. Steve Sheff uh, in the Sanders Brown uh, Center on Aging, his primary appointment, although he also has an appointment in, uh, in Scobert. And so this device has become the, uh, the leading device for producing a, a uh, computer-controlled pneumatic piston-driven uh, um, 
contusion injury uh, to the exposed uh, spinal cord. And the way this simply works is that when you activate this piston, it comes down and hits the cord and then withdraws. And then if you follow the rat pathology over the sex several weeks, you see that you get a lesion that I can tell you looks very much like the human injury where there's cystic cavitation that takes place, but still a rim of white matter tissue that represents some possibility for recovery. Well, we need to distinguish between the two aspects of injury here. The primary injury uh, that we refer to as the primary involves the mechanical shearing of axons and blood vessels that takes place. There's nothing we can do about that as far as doing something acutely. Uh, we hope that we can grow more new nerve fibers or grow new, uh, new blood vessels. And in fact, there's a great deal of research going on that, that supports that as a possibility. But what's been the focus of attention I'm going to talk about mainly today is what's called secondary injury, which represents a uh, microvascular and neuronal injury process uh, that is caused by a cascade of pathophysiological events that act during the first hour, minutes, hours, and, uh, and days to exacerbate the primary injury. And many of us in the field of spinal cord injury have been interested in trying to do something about that. Now, just to illustrate this a bit further, this is actually a cat spinal cord, and this is a normal cross-section of the cat spinal cord, and if we produce a con uh, compression injury for five minutes to that cord, remove the compression, you see that basically this spinal cord looks fairly normal. There's some acute hemorrhage that's occurred within the hypervascular uh, gray matter uh, region, but overall a fairly normal looking spinal cord. However, over the next uh, several minutes, what happens is that there's a coalescence of that hemorrhagic uh, necrosis, which is beginning within the gray matter, taking out much of the gray matter area in the injured segment. Uh, but still, the, over, the surrounding white matter with the nerve tracts that carry sensory information and motor information are still in pretty good shape. But what happens between 30 minutes and several weeks out is that there's ongoing necrotic uh, degeneration that takes place that leads to a, in typically a cystic cavity and just a rim of white matter tissue that may uh, be myelinated or unmyelinated. The chance for a person to, or an animal in this case, to have a normal neurological recovery depends upon the degree of tissue sparing and also the degree of sparing of the insulation of those nerve fibers. Well, here again, uh, just to illustrate, you have the central area of necrotic damage that's caused by a complex process involving many different players. And again, looking at our MR image of a real case, you see this edematous region here, which rep represents the beginning of this secondary injury that if it's allowed to go ahead, will uh, progressively increase and cause more and more damage to the surrounding white matter areas. Now, Dr. Joe Springer, one of our uh, uh, most important Scoberg faculty and his uh, former graduate student, Stephanie Nottingham, who's now Stephanie Thompson and is a postdoc in my lab, uh, Stephanie's thesis work with Joe involved looking at apoptotic degeneration of oligodendroglial, which are the cells that form the myelin that insulates those nerve fibers that carry sensory information and motor information up and down the spinal cord. And so what we have is oftentimes the nerve fibers themselves will survive, but the secondary injury includes an apoptotic degeneration of these myelinating cells. And so uh, part of the problem is that we have the nerve fibers, but we, without the normal insulation, they don't conduct impulses. So just to drive this home further, here's another picture of a, uh, from a spinal cord injured uh, animal uh, showing a rim of white matter tissue uh, the white matter that is stained intensely blue uh, represents tissue that's still myelinated. The light blue represents nerve fibers that have lost most of their, uh, their myelin. So again, the potential for recovery uh, involves reducing the cavitation and reducing the loss of myelin so that neurological recovery can occur. Well, what do we do about all of this? Well, there's several approaches uh, that the field of spinal cord injury is investigating as therapeutic uh, approaches. Uh, there's obviously the issue of neuroprotection where we want to try to reduce the secondary injury. Uh, there are also uh, uh, strategies in place, both pharmacological and transplantation strategies uh, aimed at trying to achieve remyelination of the surviving nerve fibers that have lost their insulation and therefore can't conduct normally.
Uh, the holy grail of spinal cord injury research is to try to regenerate the, the missing nerve fibers. Uh, there's also uh, the idea of putting in lost, replacing lost neurons with stem cell transplants of one uh, uh, type or another. Uh, there's also the possibility, which has been demonstrated uh, to some extent clinically, that certain drugs which enhance neuronal excitability might uh, be able to overcome the loss of the insulation of the nerve fibers and achieve some recovery of function. Um, there's also other approaches uh, that uh, can be used uh, to try to uh, uh, promote axonal uh, functional recovery. And then, of course, there are various biomedical engineering approaches to try to, uh, to bypass the injury and achieve uh, functional electrical stimulation so that patients, at the very least, can regain function. Well, in the remaining part of my talk, I'm just uh, going to talk about uh, one aspect of this, uh, the aspect that my laboratory has been most involved in, the reduction of the secondary injury. Uh, there, this secondary injury process has been studied extensively over the last 20 to 30 years, and there are many different players that are involved. In fact, as complex as this diagram is with lots of feedback loops be between some of these factors, uh, it's in fact even more complicated than what I'm showing here. But there have been certain areas uh, that have dominated our, our interest uh, over the years, and in my own case, it's been trying to do something about uh, the fact that injury causes formation of reactive oxygen uh, species, uh, such as this species, peroxynitrite, and free radicals that are derived from those that then cause oxidative damage to the tissue, which then spreads and is responsible for both microvascular damage as well as neuronal and myelin damage. Here's a simpler diagram showing some of the key players that have been the focus of attention as far in the secondary injury field. Injury causes first uh, a, a depolarization of the injured nerve fibers, uh, release of the neurotransmitter glutamate, which can excessively stimulate glutamate receptors. And fundamentally, this leads to an increase in intracellular calcium, which can activate a number of uh, processes, uh, some of which lead to the formation of free radicals and cause this oxidative damage. Well, my colleagues and I, going back many, many years, uh, became interested specifically in the process of free radical-induced lipid peroxidation. And what's involved here is that you have polyunsaturated fatty acids that are contained by the membrane uh, phospholipids. And here it shows a normal piece of, uh, of a typical uh, neuronal membrane or myelin membrane. And within that uh, membrane, there may be different proteins that are perhaps ion channel proteins or enzymatic proteins or structural proteins. And the structure of those proteins is, to some extent, dependent upon the maintenance of the integrity of what we call the annular or surrounding lipids, as you see here. Well, quite simply, if you attack these polyunsaturated areas of the of, uh, polyunsaturated fatty acid with a uh, free radical such as the evil hydroxyl radical, it triggers a cascade of uh, lipid peroxidation as it's called, which destroys the phospholipid membrane and causes denaturation of the proteins. Well, my colleagues and I, uh, going back 25 years ago, in fact, did this generated this piece of data where we took uh, animals and su uh, subjected them to a contusion injury, and then we measured the levels of lipid peroxidation products in the injured spinal cord and found as early as five minutes these increase significantly and further increase thereafter. Since that time, uh, my lab and other labs have taken this out and further and have shown that this process of oxidative damage continues to be reflected uh, for a matter of days and even perhaps weeks after the injury. Another way of looking at this uh, is to look at what happens to tissue vitamin E. Vitamin E is our main endogenous protective uh, mechanism for controlling lipid peroxidation. And what vitamin E does is it donates an electron uh, from this hydroxyl here to a, uh, uh, a free radical, a lipid radical, uh, known as a peroxyl radical. And by do doing that, it quenches the lipid radical, but in the process, the vitamin E is used up. Now, vitamin E can be regenerated by other processes, by receiving an electron from ascorbic acid, for instance, but the intensity of the peroxidation process after spinal cord injury is so intense that by four hours post-injury, we found that about 80% of the endogenous vitamin E is gone, reflecting again this very intense post-traumatic peroxidation process. Well, as was indicated, I was trained as a pharmacologist, and I've always thought that 
perhaps drugs represented our best way of attacking many of these disorders and became interested uh, over 25 years ago in what we might do to try to stop this peroxidation after injury. And it had been suggested by others that steroids of one type or another, because they're very lipophilic, might be able to insert themselves into cell membranes and limit what we call the propagation of these lipid peroxidation reactions after injury. Well, I was, uh, spent most of my career studying glucocorticoid steroids and was in the process of studying the effects of methylprednisolone uh, in other respects uh, on the spinal cord and decided, that, well, why don't I take a look at what, uh, whether methylprednisolone treatment can reduce peroxidation in our injured uh, animals after spinal cord injury. And being a reasonably, uh, I, I won't say great pharmacologist, but reasonably good pharmacologist, I did an extensive dose response and looked at high doses as well as lower doses and found that yes indeed, methylprednisolone administered early after the injury could reduce post-traumatic lipid peroxidation, but in fact, fairly high doses were required far out of the range that anything that had been tried earlier. However, one had to be careful, however, because if you increase the dose further, you uh, saw a U-shaped dose response where very high doses of the steroid could actually uh, exacerbate peroxidation. The other thing about the spinal cord that I haven't mentioned up to now is that it has a very rich vascularity. It needs a lot of blood flow uh, to bring oxygen to support the neuronal activity and all the uh, metabolism that goes on uh, within the, in, in the spinal cord. And an important part of the injury is to disrupt either directly by the primary injury or through the secondary injury, the delivery of blood uh, through the microvascular vasculature of the cord. So we did a long series of blood flow studies using a technique called hydrogen clearance. And what we found was that after injury, without treatment, that there's a, an initial hyperperfusion of the injured white matter and then there's a progressive decrease in blood flow that occurs over time, which if severe enough, could cause a secondary ischemic damage. We had done earlier studies showing that if you pretreated animals with high doses of the antioxidant vitamin E before injury, you could prevent this from happening. So we believed that this was due to lipid peroxidation. So we took a look at methylprednisolone and we found that indeed a 30 milligram per kilogram dose administered at 30 minutes post injury could likewise completely prevent the fall in blood flow and that this, uh, others had shown that this was associated with an improvement in recovery of neuronal activity. Also, uh, uh, another group of investigators, uh, friends of mine, Douglas Anderson and Gene Means, who were then at the University of Cincinnati, did studies with high-dose methylprednisolone and actually meticulously looked at the number of blood vessels in the injured segment histologically within the gray matter and within the white matter and they saw that there's a loss of blood vessels due to both damage as well as vasoconstriction that's seen and then if you treat with methylprednisolone early after injury and look at eight hours post injury there are many more patent blood vessels that are there. Well, inhibition of lipid peroxidation we came to believe is the key to a lot of different neuroprotective effects including the preservation of spinal cord blood flow. We also did studies showing that aerobic energy metabolism, ATP generation, uh, was, uh, was supported. Uh, another group showed ultimately that uh, inhibition of lipid peroxidation could attenuate the release of glutamate. We've also uh, shown that inhibition of lipid peroxidation appears to be important for preservation of mechanisms that control the level of uh, intracellular calcium and preserve calcium homeostasis so that uh, proteolytic enzymes that are triggered by uh, increased intracellular calcium are not activated. Well, we went on and together with a group in Cincinnati that I mentioned, Anderson Means, we uh, collaborated with them and decided to look at administration of a 48-hour dosing regimen with methylprednisolone beginning with a 30 milligram per kilogram dose followed by a constant infusion for 48 hours uh, compared to animals that received only the aqueous vehicle. And what we found is if we looked at neurologic recovery in those animals, that as early as two weeks post-injury and getting better uh, thereafter, there was a significant improvement in neurological recovery. Animals that get back to this uh, point uh, represent animals that still have some residual spasticity but are able to use their hind limbs very effectively.
Well, this work led to a clinical trial which was carried out in the, uh, the second half of the 1980s and was published in, in May of 1990 uh, that represented a randomized controlled trial of methylprednisolone or another drug that was being investigated by other labs, the opiate antagonist naloxone, which had also shown benefit in some spinal cord injury models. So what this trial um, showed, it was involved uh, 12 uh, uh, U.S. centers. They enrolled and randomized patients to placebo, methylprednisolone, or naloxone in uh, equal numbers. When they looked at the split of complete and incomplete patients, they had a pretty good randomization. And um, the methylprednisolone treated patients got the 30 milligram per kilogram bolus. There was a pause to allow for this to distribute, and then a 5.4 milligram per kilogram per hour infusion was started thereafter. The endpoints involved uh, use of the uh, ASIA scoring system, specifically the uh, neurological components where the muscles are evaluated for strength uh, on the 0 to 5 scale, uh, as well as uh, pinprick and light touch being evaluated, and of course survival as well as adverse reactions. Well, when the trial was completed, we were uh, thrilled to find out that patients that treated with high dose of methylprednisolone within the first eight hours after injury showed significantly better sensory and motor recovery compared to placebo at six weeks and six months. Motor function improvement in the methylprednisolone group was in fact maintained out to one year uh, and therefore was not considered to just be an early uh, fluke. There were no significant increase in the adverse reactions, although the clinicians in the audience realized that giving these high doses of, of a steroid is not without potential side effects, but at least containing this to a 24-hour period uh, did not cause uh, any uh, significant problems. The naloxone-treated group did show a positive trend, uh, but was not significant. To look at this in graphic form, uh, this shows the motor functional recovery in patients treated within eight hours, uh, showing again that it was statistically significant at all the, uh, the time points. So what became after that, uh, worldwide, I think it's fair to say, became sort of the standard, at least the non-official standard of care, was to administer a 24-hour dosing regimen to anybody who sustained an acute uh, spinal cord injury. Now, there are limitations to glucocorticoids, uh, some of which I just mentioned. There's a risk of glucocorticoid steroid receptor-mediated side effects, um, suppression of the immune system, which can lead to increased susceptibility to pneumonia and septic shock, uh, which the spinal cord injured patient is already prone to, diabetic complications in certain individuals, delay in wound healing. Uh, also, the trial showed that initiation of treatment after eight hours it was actually detrimental, and my own take on this is because that glucocorticoids can inhibit enzymes that are important for cleaning up and repairing membranes, and if you inhibit for things like phospholipase A2, that you can actually aggravate peroxidative damage. And then Steve Sheff in his earlier work with Carl Kopman showed that glucocorticoids in fact can inhibit some of the regenerative responses that you, and synaptogenic responses that you would hope would occur in an injured individual. So glucocorticoids are the classic two-edged sword. And so my colleagues and I, one of the things that drove me in the industry was the desire to try to uh, preserve the antioxidant effects of methylprednisolone while at the same time eliminating the glucocorticoid effects. And uh, we developed a number of steroids, one that went into actual clinical development known as Terilizad. And this is a non-glucocorticoid steroid. And it's a non-glucocorticoid because it lacks this 11-hydroxyl, uh, lacks the 17-hydroxyl, and also the 21-hydroxyl, which are essential for glucocorticoid receptor interactions. However, we didn't just duplicate the antioxidant effects of methylprednisolone by uh, placing a complex amine that has antioxidant properties of its own on the steroid side chain, we came up with a much better inhibitor of lipid peroxidation in addition to the fact that this had no steroid uh, properties. We tested this in spinal cord injured cats and uh, using the same model in which we'd evaluated methylprednisolone and we did a what's called a therapeutic window study and we found that if we administered uh, treatment with terilizad for 48 hours beginning at 30 minutes post-injury, and even if we delayed to two or four hours, we still saw the same degree of improvement in neurological recovery at four weeks post-injury. 
At eight hours, which represented the limit of the therapeutic window apparently for methylprednisolone in humans, it's interesting that although the N was not large enough to get significance, there still is, appears to be some residual effect at eight hours. So the therapeutic window for the steroid in the case of this CAT model of spinal cord injury seems to uh, replicate what we believe to be the case in humans. Well, this led to another trial uh, in which methylprednisolone 24-hour treatment, uh, which had been shown earlier to be a better than placebo, uh, was extended to 48 hours, and then also another treatment arm that involved an initial bolus of methylprednisolone followed by administration of Terilizad for 48 hours. Same kind of design, randomization of the patients. This involved 14 North American centers, including two Canadian centers, uh, one of which was the University of Toronto. And when the results were uh, looked at, uh, well, the other thing they did in this trial was that because of the fact that methylprednisolone given within eight hours worked, suddenly the neurosurgical community thought, well, okay, we can do this. We can treat these injuries faster than we've been treating them. Let's look at treatment, ultra-early treatment within three hours versus treatment between three and eight hours. And what they found, let's just look at the six-month uh, group of uh, bars here. In the case of the methylprednisolone uh, treatment or the Terilizad group or the 48-hour methylprednisolone, patients treated within the first three hours showed the same degree of neurological recovery. So 24 hours of methylprednisolone was just as good as Terilizad or just as good as uh, extending the methylprednisolone treatment. However, if patients weren't treated within the first three hours but were treated somewhere between three and eight hours, then methylprednisolone for 48 hours was significantly better than 24-hour methylprednisolone, and Terilizad came somewhere in between. Well, this was sort of disappointing that Terilizad wasn't at least as good, but the problem was that the randomization in this trial did not work well, and in fact, the patients that were randomized to Terilizad actually had worse degrees, of, significantly worse degrees of injury than the other two groups. Now, this trial that I just showed you was criticized because of the fact that there was no placebo group. But after the first trial, the, the neurosurgical community says, it's unethical for us to do a placebo-controlled trial. We have to use 24-hour methylprednisolone as a comparator group. Well, of course, they, they said that, and then they turned around and said, well, you know, there was no placebo group. How do we really know this stuff works? Well, in an attempt to kind of put the second trial, which is actually the third trial, and I didn't bother to explain the very first trial, but uh, this trial uh, that didn't have a placebo, if we compare that with the, the previous trial that did have a placebo, if you look at the neurological recoveries at six months in the patients that were treated out on average between seven and eight hours, you see that in this, uh, the, the groups over here do show a, a better recovery compared to placebo if you could uh, dare extract the placebo information over to here. So anyway, this it represents the, uh, the trials that were done uh, to look at the efficacy of methylprednisolone and Terilizad. The other thing that came out that led to some controversy was the fact that as you extend treatment from 24 to 48 hours, then the predictable glucocorticoid receptor-mediated effects begin to show their ugly head. And for instance, the incidence of severe sepsis, while small, was uh, more than in the 24-hour uh, methylprednisolone, although not quite significant. But the incidence of severe pneumonias uh, was significantly increased, although the incidence is still fairly low. Where Terilizad may have had an advantage was that the side effects uh, profile was better than, than either of the other groups. Well, we've gone on to focus on uh, the, uh, the inhibition of lipid peroxidation and inhibition of oxidative damage in general, uh, because this is the one area in which we've had some efficacy uh, shown in these trials. Uh, Terilizad has arguably come closest uh, to success in clinical trials of any uh, new drug tested, uh, but clearly we need better antioxidants with greater potency, greater ability to penetrate the brain and spinal cord, and also ideally when you're trying to scavenge free radicals, Ideally, if they had what's chemically called a catalytic scavenging mechanism, that would be better. Moreover, subsequent to the, trial, the studies with methylprednisolone and trilizad, we've come to realize that perhaps this reactive oxygen species, peroxynitrite, may in fact be the key guy that we need to do something about. Uh, I'm not going to take you through this complex chemistry here. I'm just going to point to this. This is peroxynitrite uh, in its different forms, and these are the free radicals represented with a dot. 
that represent the evil uh, uh, humors that are produced from uh, peroxynitrite that we think produce a lot of injury. Peroxynitrite can not only trigger lipid peroxidation, but it can also cause protein oxidative damage and protein modifications. And in fact, the ability of peroxynitrite nitrite to nitrate tyrosine residues provides a biomarker for the effects of this, uh, this oxidant species. So my graduate student, Yixin Zhang, who's going to defend her dissertation in about uh, two weeks from now, uh, has uh, done studies to look at peroxynitrite mediated damage in a rat model. And here, looking at nitrotyrosine immunostaining, you see that compared to a non-injured spinal cord, that as early as one hour, there's intense peroxynitrite-related protein nitration that's apparent that tends to spread uh, as we go out towards six hours, along with the formation of this cystic cavity. There's also a lipid peroxidation that occurs in parallel uh, as measured by this marker. If you transect the cord in a longitudinal way, you can see that not only is this going on at the center of the injury, but it also spreads up and down the spinal cord some distance. Now, where does this peroxynitrite come from? Well, we think it comes from the mitochondria, which are essential uh, for our lives and maintenance of our cells and energy metabolism. But for some reason, there are, is the capability to produce reactive oxygen species within mitochondria. And one of these that's produced through the combination of superoxide radical and nitric oxide is none other than the evil substance peroxynitrite. Well, Pat Sullivan and Sasha Robshevsky and Skoberg have been doing some very meticulous studies to look at the time course of mitochondrial dysfunction in the injured spinal cord of rats, and they found, done a very uh, uh, labor-intensive time course, and found that as early as 12 hours, the mitochondria in the injured segment that are isolated and studied uh, lose their respiratory capacity, and this becomes uh, most intense by 24 hours post-injury. Well, Yi Chin in my lab has been looking at the ability of an antioxidant known as Tempol, which is able to catalytically scavenge peroxynitrite-derived radicals and looking at its neuroprotective capability. Our rationale is that if we can take out these radicals, then we can prevent further mitochondrial and cell membrane damage, preserve calcium homeostasis, and attenuate post-traumatic neurodegeneration. So Yi Chin has shown that early administration of Tempol to her injured rats, in fact, significantly reduces oxidative damage uh, caused by peroxynitrite, both in terms of protein nitration and protein uh, uh, lipid peroxidation, which then is secondarily reflected in the proteins. When she looked histologically, she didn't do a systematic study, but there is an appearance of a greater tissue preservation, and uh, that was perhaps predicted by the fact that on average, the respiratory capacity of the mitochondria was improved by uh, early treatment with, with Tempol. Now another aspect, as I pointed out, is the, what oxidative damage does to calcium homeostasis, and, and one of the consequences of disruption of calcium homeostasis and increasing calcium levels in the neuron is to activate things like uh, the protease calpane, which can cause extensive proteolytic damage. And so uh, Yi Chin looked at that uh, using a marker called spectrin and looking at spectrin breakdown products and found that these are severely increased at 24 hours post-injury and that Tempol treatment, uh, which does not directly affect calpain, uh, attenuated this significantly. Dr. Robshevsky's lab uh, has actually looked at Tempol treatment of rats and then taken them out in time to six weeks post-injury, evaluating their motor recovery using a scale that's used uh, to evaluate motor function in rats and found that there is a significant uh, increase in outcome or motor recovery in rats treated with Tempol. Now the downside of Tempol is that there's a very short opportunity to use Tempol, it appears, and uh, Yi Chin showed that if you want to attenuate proteolytic damage, looking at calpane uh, activated damage, that if you give Tempol uh, 15 minutes or right after the injury, there's an effect. If you wait an hour, there you get the same effect. But if you wait until two hours, uh, there's no longer an effect. Well, one of the things we're doing is to, uh, to begin to look at combination therapies. Uh, we realize that things like Tempol have, uh, leave a lot undone. And some of the other approaches we're looking at are uh, direct inhibitors of uh, calpane, 
direct inhibitors of uh, mitochondrial dysfunction, as well as lipid peroxidation inhibitors that can perhaps assist Tempol in its antioxidant effect. Well, one other thing I want to tell you about uh, is that the other thing that needs to be done, obviously, is when you have a situation like this after a spinal cord injury where you have these bony fragments pressing on the cord, you need to do something about this fairly quickly. And I don't know if there are any of my neurosurgical colleagues in the audience, but it, the neurosurgical community has been slow to embrace this concept, that they need to go in and operate and stabilize the spinal column and remove these bony fragments so that the injury is not further aggravated. And in fact, this has been known to be the fact for 10 years. One of the leading authorities, Michael Failings from Toronto, uh, has published uh, numerous places that patients need to be treated with methylprednisolone, and they also need uh, in addition to the, the other emergency management, they need to uh, have a mobilization of the injured spine as quickly as possible. This is a picture of uh, my colleague and one of our uh, uh, leading spinal cord injury scientists, Skobrick, Dr. Rabshevsky, uh, who became interested because of his own injury uh, during his college years in a motorcycle accident. He had a uh, T5 injury and uh, had to have his spinal cord uh, uh, stabilized with uh, what were uh, used then, Harrington rods, and this is an, a, a picture showing uh, uh, Dr. Rabshevsky's uh, back, uh, but this is why I'm talking about spinal cord stabilization. Well, Dr. Failings, who feels passionately about this, uh, has, been, uh, has put together a clinical trial to look at patients who are not uh, operated on until after 24 hours post-injury and what kinds of neurological recoveries they show versus patients treated within 24 hours post-injury. And those uh, patients operated on within 24 hours, although this trial is in process, are showing significantly improved recoveries with four times as many patients showing a greater than two uh, uh, improvement in the ASIA score of two or more grades as a result of early surgery. I think many of you heard about this very um, uh, case that was in the news of uh, the Buffalo Bills defensive end, uh, Kevin Everett, who was injured on September 11th during a football game, had a severe, complete cervical spinal cord injury, uh, and uh, with including, he was in Asia A, complete sensory motor paralysis from the neck down, and also it was a high lesion with difficulty breathing. And within two months' time, he's up and walking with his fiance again. Well, I've been able to get the details of uh, his treatment. He happened to have a very aggressive team physician, and uh, his injury occurred at 2.30. He was in the ambulance by 2.45 and taken off the field. They started an ice-cold saline infusion to try to achieve lower the body temperature, lower the cord temperature, uh, based upon a whole other body of work showing that lowering the temperature, production of hypothermia, can reduce this secondary injury process. Well, the doctor didn't stop there. Uh, when they got to the hospital, immediately, uh, within 45 minutes post, uh, uh, or with a half hour post injury, methylprednisolone treatment was uh, started. And right after that, he improved to Asia B, had some deep sensation in the legs, and he was still maintained as hypothermic. He had a CT scan then after that, showing there was a severe compression of the spinal cord. The spinal cord was crushed, however, not severed. There was hemorrhage, and it was at the C4 level. They did de decompression surgery at three hours post-injury and uh, kept him in the ICU overnight uh, in a hypothermic state. And uh, at um, 6 a.m. the next morning, he improved to an Asia C, some sensory, some motor uh, return taking place. Five months later, he is at Asia D. In other words, he has motor function below the level of lesion, but at least um, half of uh, muscle strength in the affected dermatomes. Well, before I show that, what was responsible for the recovery? Well, anybody who's followed this case uh, will have seen in the papers that the hypothermia has gotten all the press. But in fact, this was an, uh, uh, the first demonstration of uh, combination therapy with hypothermia, methylprednisolone, early decompression surgery within four hours. And in fact, my uh, take on this is it's really the remarkable recovery has made is due to this combination. Well, these are my very distinguished colleagues from the, uh, the Scobert Corps faculty uh, around me, including uh, uh, the infamous uh, Dr. Rabshevsky and uh, my associate directors, uh, 
uh, Dr. Geddes and Dr. Sullivan and, and all of my other colleagues who I'm very uh, uh, fortunate to be working with. So I thank you for your attention and uh, thank you very much.